Hello, so we're here at Go to Amsterdam 2023 in a sunny Amsterdam, Netherlands. And I'm here to do a Go to Unscripted. So I'm Matt Turner from Tetrate, and I'm going to be talking to Daniel Bryan. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Bryant. Uh, I'm an independent consultant at the moment, having worked with Ambassador Labs for a number of years before, uh, and looking forward to chatting with my buddy, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, yeah, so I'm a software engineer at Tetrate. Uh, I guess this is a broad software engineering conference. So just yeah. to step back for the folks who don't know, I guess, you know, both of our backgrounds is sort of cloud native stuff, the more so. cloudy modern side of the tech. And we will be uh, probably talking mostly about infrastructure Sounds kind good. of things, I imagine. <laughs> just a level set for folks that this isn't going to be like a React kind of chat, I guess. Yeah. Um, it is unscripted. We really haven't unscripted it. Yes. Really haven't scripted it at all. We have um, got interesting conversations all the time, Matt. So I'm just thinking. I feel like we do. Yeah, <laughs> and this time we're sober. So you know, this might even make sense. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, we literally just came out the back of your talk yeah, uh, yeah. here, which obviously folks can see on the on the website when it goes live, which, yeah, I thought was, was really good, really interesting. Appreciate it. Um, I like the way you, you know, set the stage and, and sort of stepped back and said, you know, why are we talking about all of this technology? What is it? And where does it fit into your organization? What's your organization yeah. trying to do? What's it you want to achieve? Um, this is, I know it's unscripted. I am technically meant to be interviewing you, which, is, which means <laughs> yeah, you talk. do talk more talking than me, uh, which is good. Um, I don't know, can we kind of stitch you up right at the start and say like, what, what is an API gateway? Let's talk about that topic for a bit. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question then. Cause like someone actually at the end of the talk asked about like, is an Nginx in front of my microservice an API gateway? And I was like, yes, it's a good question. <laughs> um, and I probably should have defined it a bit clearer actually in the talk, because I think like both you and I have worked in this space for a long time, Matt, right? And mm -hmm. an API gateway means many things to many people. And really for me, it is just like where you're doing your traffic management, particularly your north south traffic yeah. management, your ingress traffic management. And I think over the years, you know, an API gateway used to be very focused on APIs, sounds obvious, but now I definitely think folks in some ways are like, I'm just mapping routes or, you know, mm. I'm just exposing ports and like whatever protocol, right? But I think um, the, the history is around actually the API management space. So people were like actually creating, say, REST APIs in particular. We've been seeing some, you know, protocol buff and all that kind of stuff, yeah. but mainly REST APIs, but like back in the day, like sort of the SOAP era, um, and people were like, this actually is really critical to the business and therefore I need to manage this thing. And it was like, where do we manage it? Well, where the traffic's flowing in. And that's like the API management and it's a gateway. API gateway was kind of born. But I think these days, like we see in the Kubernetes land, like people even call Nginx an API gateway. Yeah. And like initially like, I resisted that because I was like, Nginx is a proxy, right? right. Like, you know, just routes traffic, right? <laughs> but I was like, no, I kind of get it. Like you are putting APIs at the edge of your system and you are mm. like controlling the access with Nginx, HA proxy, Istio these days will like pick, you know, take your pick, right? And like even Istio as a service mesh has an API gateway sort of a gateway yeah. least component, right? Yeah. So I think it means many things to many folks. And this is sort of one part of the the time or one time I should say where I'm not too hung up on the terminology. Like, you know, you and I have talked about this before, mm -hmm. like sometimes terminology and words matter a lot, right? And I, I think it's still, they still do, but like, I wouldn't call something that's like obviously not an API gateway, an API gateway. But I was more concerned today with saying to folks, if you're managing cloud native traffic, like you're gonna be using something that is an API gateway to get user traffic into your backend systems. Mm -hmm. There'll be other things involved, service mesh, which is very much your expertise in that, CNI, uh, SDN, that kind of stuff. But the, the API gateway is where the rubber meets the road, where the users hit the backend systems, right? Yes. Yeah, I think the word for me, the word management does a lot of lifting there, right? Because why do you even need to manage it? And I think to your point that you made in your talk is that people smear business logic into that, just like they did with ESBs, <laughs> just like they did with aspects in aspects oriented programming, yeah. uh, just like they did into utility classes, you know, we've, 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 it, right? we've, seen this, <laughs> we've seen this before and we've all done it and I've smeared logic into the API gateway as well. You know, what do you even need to manage if your API is if you're if the system serving your API is perfect, then maybe it could just be a router. Maybe it is yeah. just a layer four device, right? That is yep. just that is just a, a tunnel. But realistically, you probably want some extra security, like a WAF. You, probably, you want bot blocking. You want load totally. shedding. Yep. If you've got yep. a, if you've got a fat gRPC server and, and a service mesh in front of that, and you can do all of these things, you know, a, a proxy, a sidecar proxy that can do OIDC challenges, then then maybe you don't need it. But I think that's what we often tend to mean by management. And then you do get more into the I want to publish an API to this thing. Yes, and I'm going agreed. to give you a schema, yep, yep. a version schema, hopefully with a, you know, a schema for the body. Yep. And, you know, please reject, you know, please fail fast and, you know, reject requests that come in too quickly, reject requests that, requests that don't meet my body. Yeah, totally. Or please transform body version one to body version <laughs> yes. two. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> 
please patch this error in the program because it was quicker to redeploy, reconfigure True the enough, API right? gateway than yeah. reconfigure the so service. That for jail and that well, I was, good. I was about to say, I think that's where we hit an anti-pattern, right? Because that's business mm -hmm. logic. But actually, mm -hmm. we helped a lot of folks at Tetra, I have to do a plug. We, <laughs> no, we helped a lot of folks mitigate log4j because yeah, you can yeah. match the headers and the bodies and it was really quick to, That's if you have if you have sidecars, then you can do it there as well. So on, we, we did both, but why not drop it at the edge too? Yeah. And I think that's where the gateway API comes in because you've got a unified management, you know, API unified control plane for, for both components. But yeah, management does, you know, it does a lot of heavy lifting as a, as a word. But I think I agree, to me, it's a proxy with, with features. I right. like that, yes. Because I, I know one mm. talk I did, I actually had like a, almost like a spectrum, right? And I had mm. like that sort of classic, you know, Nginx, OpenRest, DHA proxy, Envoy proxy, all the way through to Apogee, three scale, right. like heavyweight kind of, you know, business stuff, right? And then like you can somewhere on that spectrum pick where your API gateway yeah. is, right? Right. It's like, do I have no features? Did I just download, say, Envoy? Yep. You know, do I have the open source features? in terms of a bit of rate limiting or something. That's so right. I have the paid for features that folks are starting to add, yep. like advanced bot blocking or, or yeah. schema. Security observability, security like like management, that's, API management. what's critical. That's Pay what money you, for that, right? It's like, well, yeah, it's, criti spend. it's critical. It's where you, it's what you need it if you're regulated. So folks, to your capitalism point, folks do take the you know, opportunity to make money off that. But also yeah. it's the high value stuff. It's the stuff that takes a lot of engineering work for the, for the companies to build. So, so I think you know, it, it's the kind of thing where you would make a build decision even if there was a dollar cost attached to it, a, a yeah. buy decision, sorry, if there was a dollar cost attached rather than, Agreed. A, rather than a bill. Because it's actually directly translating to the value you would offer mm. as a business, right? Or yeah. in cost you would incur. So Got, yeah, higher cost you would incur because it's a difficult thing to engineer. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Something you touched on, Matt, which I thought was curious there, is like we talk a lot about ingress with API gateways, right? But like you, you mentioned the example with the um, like log for shell, log for j issue. That was a lot about egress, right? In terms of like scanning mm. stuff as it was leaving the environment. So I think that's something interesting with API gateways. A lot of folks focus on the ingress, but you can also look at sort of what's egressing from your systems mm. there as well, right? I don't know if you've got any experience around sort of like observability in that um, regard, or even things like um, security. I know a bunch of folks have been chatting online around in particular like data exfiltration, things like that, right? Either you, could, I guess you can do it at the service mesh kind of level or the sidecar level, um, but you can also do it at the API gateway level. Mm. I mean, did you see that with the whole log for shell stuff? Were you deliberately patching and looking at payloads coming back through the gateways or see it through the sidecars. We, we saw folks who wanted to, it, it's difficult. I think there's a lot going on there is, okay, so a naive network doesn't have any kind of proxy, right? It's let, you know, layer three, I give my, I've got, okay, let's say I've got one VM offering a service, one container offering a service. I give it a publicly routable IP. It's now yep. on the internet, you know, requests come in, requests go out. Probably not great. So the first thing I do, I mean, you know, zero trust is a, is a whole other thing, but the first thing I do is isolate it in some way. Yep. So maybe it still has a publicly routable IP and I've got a sidecar that's doing MTLS and it's doing yep. the zero trust thing. Or more traditionally, I would put it in an isolated network. I would, you know, make those, I put it on a, a VPC, I, I yeah, makes sense. subnet that's unroutable and I, and I put a proxy in the way and that's the way to get it. So I think you do extra, you know, checks. Um, they're, they're kind of the same if you squint to them in the right way, right? So then I have that ingress and then that ingress, I upgrade to an API gateway by adding these kind of features like, oh, I want to filter headers for the, or bodies for the JNBI, whatever yep. string. Yep. But I think another level of sophistication, yeah, is, is egress management. I mean, you see, you should go to any big enterprise, anybody that's regulated, you'll see there'll be DLP. Right, yes. data loss prevention. And what, Big time. You're right, what's that other than an appliance, a pizza box that you rack and stack? All the egress traffic has to go through it and it tries to look for documents to say, you know, company confidential or they do more than that, but you know, you, yeah, yeah. you, you get the idea. So we do see folks doing this, you know, not going to that level, but doing this with Istio. You know, the obvious thing is that I just want to firewall everything, right? So I want to, yeah. I, I want to allow list, you know, no egress is allowed. Be oh, interesting. Because why? So locked down by default. So locked down by default. Yeah. And then I want to allow list. Oh, this, you know, uh, we use weather.com to provide whatever service, you know, we use. We use, because a lot of stuff is now third party online APIs, yeah, right? True so enough, we use right. weather.com and, and some mapping service, uh, some postcode, you know, zip code yeah, to yeah. address PayPal APIs. Right? Like PayPal API yeah. is probably a better example. <laughs> so you can allow list those one by one. And then it, with, some, with something like a service mesh, you can actually get more sophisticated and allow list them service by service. So this service has, ah, has reason to be talking. Kind of, yeah. Right, and the reason yeah, I would yeah. say a service mesh is because you've got, you can't really do that by source IP, but once you've got a strong identity for every service, Love it. Yep. you force, tra the way you do it with this Joe is you would force traffic through, you set up an egress gateway, Yes. force traffic through it. So if anyone managed to sort of bypass their sidecar or break out of the CNI or something, you know, there's no egress from it. By security group, right? by really low level construct, 
there's no egress from this network other than through the egress gateway. And then you can start allow listing things like that and say, hey, yeah, the, nice. the order service gets to talk to the PayPal API, the Stripe API, the um, you know stock prediction service talks to weather.com or, or whatever it is. Um, did we see anybody trying to block like egress for log for shell? Not, I, not that I can remember, but, it, but if you have that allow listing, you know, deny by default approach, then I guess you'll kind of do it. I don't remember anybody. I think and it may be trying to trying to right, match, but yeah, I think I've seen on the internet people match, like sort of saying yeah. like this is a quick filter for like you know these kind of things. Absolutely. Well, I did a KubeCon talk uh, with a good friend of mine, Francesco Beltramini from Control Plane. Uh, we did that in in Amsterdam, and we were talking about incidents response, security incident response, yeah, yeah. and how it varies in a cloud native environment. And one mm. of the things we said was, well, you've got a lot more tech now. You've got, <laughs> right, a, right? You've got a lot yeah. more options. So actually, if you think you're on, because you can't prevent every attack. And actually, you often want to know quite a lot about if you are under attack, especially if it's targeted at you, you want to be able to learn quite a lot about it. So what we were saying is, if you think you're under attack, or if you've got a, a pod or workload that you think is compromised because, you know, Falco is saying it's making weird syscalls yeah, yeah. or something, yeah. then actually you want to, you may want to let that attack continue, but you want to watch the egress. So you want to see where it's connecting what to, it's you know, what DNS yeah, request it's yeah, doing, yeah. what IPs it's connecting to. Can you find its C2 network, basically? Yeah, yeah. And then what is going out? Does this look like IRC traffic? Does it look like some kind of C2 command and control? Thing does it look like your data being exfilled? In which case, you probably want to, yeah, want to stop to stay away. pretty quickly, right? <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, we see it. As, you'd see it as an interesting observability point, and an interesting, as you say, a place to do defense in depth. Um, it's difficult. Like if you ever get a you know, get your home router and just deny all. Yeah, right. You'd be um, like, it's, it's a good security <laughs> stance to have. And then I'll, I'll, I'll just open. I know the you know the uh, I won't say any of the names because people's <laughs> devices will go off at home. But I know you know I know this smart speaker is probably going to talk to its services, yeah. and and I you know I'll open things one by one. And then you know if you've got some kind of way of doing identity, you know my my phone, my laptop should be able to, yeah, uh, allowed right. to browse the internet. But maybe I carve out a, if you've got a sophisticated home router, I carve out a separate subnet. You know, a separate SSID for all the smart home things. You know, all the bulbs you buy off oh, eBay. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you say, I'm going to block all, all and they've all got web servers in them. <laughs> yeah. right? Not only do I want to block ingress because they've all got web servers in, and that's yeah. a massive security hole. I want to block egress because what are they doing? Why are they dialing home? They just don't need to. You'd be surprised how much breaks and how much you have <laughs> to how much you have to open to get like functionality back for these devices. It's kind yeah. of scary. That, I mean, that's like we were saying earlier on, like just in general, like the plethora of technology gets emerged is amazing. You and I make our living out of it, right? But at the same time, the complexity is shot through the roof. Yeah. I, I sort of trying to like hint at that some of my, my talk today. And that's a great example in terms of like, I think most of us are just like, did it at home, we're just like, whatever, allow all. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. But in a business, you can't do no, that, you can't right? Do that. <laughs> right. And that gave me a real appreciation for the sort of security compliance teams in. Mm. Yeah, I've worked in a couple of regulated places and you just think like, they really do have to allow list everything. That's um, a fun. That's why you and I build stuff. Right? Well, security, right. Right? well, it's interesting. <laughs> it's a super said. important job. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, I drive me nuts. <laughs> well, and that's where you need to get the dev experience right and, and yeah. whatever. And maybe we'll come on to that. But it's interesting you talk about uh, platform engineering. And you, well, you talk about things getting super complicated and trying yes. to hint at that. And I think this is my point of view on the platform engineering. Is you talked a lot about cognitive load and yeah, the right. cognitive load on teams, app development teams just gets so high. And I think we saw it get high trying to write everything in C and having to write your own linked list, right? So we invented Java. And then it got high again when folks had to do their own deployment. You build it, you run it. But deployments, especially Canary deployments, progressive delivery, again, something we might come on to, that got super complicated. So we built them platforms, API yep. gateways, and all these kind of things. And I think now their cognitive load on just infrastructure. I just want to operate this thing, debug it. It needs a bit of storage. It needs some DNS records. It needs traffic management, you know, east to west. Yeah. I need observability. That all gets so complicated. And I think that's where we're seeing platform engineering really coming into its own. If you subscribe to the team topologies model, right, and you have a yeah. platform team that's enabling. Yes. What are your, you know, I've put a bunch of words into in my own mouth there. But what, <laughs> I mean, what's your opinion on, on platform engineering, on the self-service thing? What does you build it, you run it? Because we say you build it, you run it, but mm. then we say actually you should have a platform engineering team. Like, how does that all fall out in your opinion? Yeah, I think like someone asked me this about the day about sort of like platform engineering and DevOps and things, and I think a lot of us have been doing platform engineering before we had a word for it or phrase for it. Do you know what I mean? Like, and you and I have probably been building platforms. I used to rack and stack back in the right. day, and that was kind of platform engineering, right? 
But these days, there is many more components within a typical platform. Back in the day, it was like rack and stack a server, you put like a Java app server on it, maybe front it with a like web server or something, and that's kind of happy days, right? And the, the attack vector, attack surface, was, was pretty small because you kind of knew those bits of kit and whatever. Whereas these days, we're spinning up virtual environments and, you know, the notion of self-service now is no longer that racking and stacking. Mm. It is calling APIs, calling yeah. SDKs. And I think the modern definition of platform engineering is around how we build the ultimate platform that developers, operators use to get their day job done. How we build that platform so they can self-serve on things like being able to spin up a new service, being able to deploy a service, mm. as you mentioned, being able to monitor that service. So all the kind of machinery around that process for me is, is, is the sort of discipline of platform engineering. Do you know what I mean? And I think, and now, like just with the, the sheer complexity out there, it is a really valuable discipline, particularly in big companies. Like I think, you know, sort of some ops teams, some infrastructure teams are somewhat being rebranded as platform engineering teams, but I think they are also bringing in new skills. Like uh, yeah. you came up to me at the end of my talk and went, ah, oh, team topologies. And I was like, oh, I didn't mention it explicitly, but right. totally right, Matt. Right? See the thread of it, yeah. And, and a lot of folks I'm chatting to, and granted it is like, somewhat biased with like either customers or folks at conferences, but they have read that book, like team topologies blew the kind of doors off like, of the way yeah. people build products, right? build platforms. Um, so people are really now thinking about that cognitive load and, and almost tr um, chasing the holy grail of like the Heroku-like experience, the cloud yeah. foundry experience. That was kind of the pinnacle, right? Like yeah. even more so than racking and stacking and putting an app server on, on, on something. Like Heroku for me was like as close to we get as close as we can get to perfection of like Ruby on Rails apps in particular. Right. You know what I mean? Standard form factor, 12 factor apps. Yep. Um, they were sort of stateless to some degree as well. But like that was, it was Nirvana for a while, right? It was. <laughs> I was and the, it. <laughs> the amount of Kubernetes teams, DevOps teams using Kubernetes that you just see trying to rebuild Heroku or folks going all in on AWS or whatever, yep. just trying to rebuild Heroku. Um, and that's not a bad thing, you know. There's a, there's a yeah, there's a reason for that. Is it, yeah, interesting. You talk about standardization of all the apps. Yeah, right. Looking the same for the outside. When it was Ruby, you know, when it was Ruby, you had Rails, so you had the sort of standard. Everything was the same because you used the same framework. That's it. Everything kind of quacked. This everything was operationalized the same. That's not that's not back grammar, but you know what I mean. <laughs> well, exactly. Everything yeah. ran the same because because of the twelve factor thing. Yep. I think containers. Well, what let us do that across different languages, right? Because everything now looks the same from the outside. Everything runs the same. Everything fits into the same, you know, hole yeah, when yeah. we deploy it. But we still need the rest of the Heroku experience. That's it. Based on top of it. I think it's, yeah, it's interesting. We Because we talk about self-serve. To me, I think there's two levels. There's two things that platform teams do. One is to chop off the layers, right? Because there's so many layers. Now, I'm yeah, talking literally, you know, power, physical security, data centers, yep. all the way out through clusters and networking and stuff. And for a long time, you know, I've talked to CTOs. It's like, my job is to chop layers off the stack, chop layers yeah, off the stack. Yeah, that's good enough. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, so yeah. now maybe AWS takes a lot of the, you know, deals with the power bill and whatever. And yeah, then yeah. you uh, manage cluster even. And then you have a platform team that extracts more layers. But then the self-service mm. to me is there's always going to be one layer where we have to meet. Because you build it, you run it. It's like you run it at this layer of abstraction. So yeah. maybe we do give you kubectl access and maybe you do write CRDs or maybe you run it within the abstraction that we've built. So one of those layers is going to be like, I think the app team should only ever be interfacing with the top layer if they have to care about lower layers. Makes sense. You've probably not built an abstraction right. And there's always going to be collaboration to me at that layer. That's what I think that's what we mean by actually self-service. Is maybe they can have that layer all to themselves, but realistically they probably can't. And so there's going to be two sets of folks trying to work there. Yeah, something I really like that, that kind of like chopping the stack. Because I've seen lots of diagrams of like how containers have allowed us to do that and then Amazon managed services. Um, Something that I, you just mentioned there, like, I think the notion of mechanical sympathy is really important. And it kind of nicely gels with what you're saying in that as an app developer, I actually just want to like put something in a container and run it. And I want to be able to like monitor things. But if I understand one level down, yes. mechanical sympathy, like I know yeah. it's going to be running in a container. I know it's going to be ultimately on Kubernetes. And I sort of have an idea of the pod abstractions, uh, or maybe even how the VMs work, how the networks work at a very basic level, mm. I can build more effective systems. So I think that's why I've seen some struggles recently of like, to your point, I've seen every abstraction leaks, right? Just the way it is. And people are like, hey, I'm deploying on Kubernetes here, even though the platform team's tried to hide yeah, it, right? Yeah, they, right. they know it. No, 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 this is, yeah. Yeah, no, actually, it's not a bad thing. Because like, if you completely abstracted Kubernetes away, um, some of the things that they see happening um, would, would like not make as much sense as when they know it's actually Kubernetes. Mm. So it's a fine line, right? That's interesting. And it's so much work. It would be so much work 
for the app team, it would be so much work for the app team to learn the whole stack. Yes, exactly. Cognitive load can't be done, but yep. it also be, it's also so much work for the platform team to hide all of those things exactly. to make exactly. a perfect Heroku. Yep. So where do, I think you have to choose which abstractions you expose, which ones you allow Agreed. to leak. But I think the mechanical, the mechanical simply things are really interesting, actually. Maybe there's a layer in our diagram where the app team gets to play. Either they own it completely, ideally, or they yeah. interact. But understanding the one below them, because I'm, I, a lot of the talks, a lot of my talks that are successful, some folks do big ideas talks, right? The kind of things that I often do are just like explainers. Uh, your Wistia I mean, one always stood out to me when you, when I was right. seeing Wistia. I went to in uh, Code Node in the UK in London, and you're like, "Is that Istio? Is that a packet goes through Istio?" And I was like, "I get it." Right, <laughs> and that's and should you need to know that as a user of Istio? Yeah, good, no. point. good point. And it's interesting. Yeah. I, like this is crystallized in my mind because you always get imposter syndrome, right? I certainly always get imposter yeah, syndrome. For sure. And I would stand up on stage and try to justify the talk, especially when I'd been invited to the conference. Yeah, and it makes sense. Often, you know, that talk did fairly well. It became fairly famous. And I'd get invited to these conferences that weren't even infrastructure engineering yeah, conferences, right. where they'd be like a software conference or something. It'd be a bunch of Java devs. <laughs> and I would feel the need to exp mm. explain myself and say why I'm here. I'm like, okay, well, you, you need to know this because if it breaks, Yes. You're going to have to debug it, so yep. you're going to need to understand how it works. But actually, no, I think you're. I think you're right. I think what we're teaching is a lot of what I've found myself doing is teaching folks the layer below. That's it. So that and that's really interesting. Yeah, Even on the good day, so they understand level. it. Yeah. They have a mental model for it, and it's not just the debugging. Like you drive a car, right? You just drive a car. You know, it breaks. You call someone. Yeah. I'm sure there's a great analogy in here. Is that it's, it's, you could just have breakdown cover? Like yeah. anything totally goes right. wrong. Yeah, yeah. That's turn the SRE away. team. <laughs> it's the SRE team. Very expensive. Yes. <laughs> or you could learn how the car works, and a you can have a go at fixing it yourself. That's right. But b it's that mechanical sympathy. If I will drive it in a way such that it maybe it won't break. Totally. And if I hear this Great noise, much. then I know that like, ooh, that's a bit of stress on this component. I'm going to change the way I do things. That's a very interesting way. I like that. So that, that's it. Like came, that. uh, Martin Thompson, who uh, spoke at GoTo a number of times, like it sort of crystallized for me. He was doing a lot of talks around mechanical sympathy and he goes properly down to the metal, right? He was like using right. Java in ways it shouldn't be used. It's fantastic, yeah. right? And I, as a, like, a, like you and I kind of like, well, as a one percenters, we like, we always like, to know everything pretty much, right? Yeah. That's kind of who we are, and that's why we go to conferences. But like, not everyone wants to know that, not everyone needs to know that, and that's totally fine. I'm not trying mm -hmm. to use 1% as like some elitist term, but I think you and I are always poking into this stuff. So when Martin Thompson starts saying, here's what mechanical sympathy was, but I, I would be, never be building systems that he was gonna build. But I was fascinated in the way yeah. he'd use some of the unsafe Java stuff that made me understand right. the Java uh, memory model better. And I could write Java code better knowing the memory model, right? right? And I was like, and that's that one level down, the little cracks sort of show through in the abstraction. And I was never gonna use some stuff, I wouldn't trust myself, right? <laughs> it wasn't yeah, yeah. stuff. But I was like, wow, like I get how the heap works better. Oh, and that's why you gotta be careful with the stack and that kind of stuff. So just like having, and it's like, your analogy is perfect in terms of like, um, peeking down to the containers or, or like with the car, like knowing mm. how to, um, when to change gear most. Right, right, exactly. Like yeah. Power bands and like yeah. not revving to the red line every time. Right. Because you're going to break your engine. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You've got it when you need it. And I, I always find those talks super interesting as well. I don't, I, I've never really done much Java. I, I, I was initially an embedded C programmer. You had to kind of know your architecture to get acceptable performance. And now I love Rust. Yeah, and oh, you do yeah. see these talks. You're like, "Hey, Russ, we're just going to turn the safeties off, essentially. <laughs> yeah, right? Right. Uh, we could turn the traction control off. You can do that in a car yeah, as exactly. long as you actually totally. know how to drive one to the next level. If it starts to slide, there's no system. I can only it's only safe to do that if I know what to do. Yes, right. And I think it's the same. I can turn the safeties off in Rust, and if I actually understand my processor and its memory pipeline and its cache invalidation yeah, and yeah. all of this stuff, it's safe to do that. And you always see every conference there'll be some high frequency trading house. We'll do a fascinating talk, right? Yeah. Where they're like, oh yeah, we 10 x our performance by just, you know, yeah. like we, we know how the pipeline works. We just tell the thing not to flush it because we know we're being safe. Yeah, yeah. And like, just always That's Formula One racing, right? Yeah, exactly. Most of us go to the shops, like stuff. I'm driving my little like Seattle, yeah. whatever. I yeah, right. don't need like driving But it's fascinating to hear about. <laughs> it is. It is um, but I think, yeah, every day, but we all do probably need to know at least how our container works. And, and yeah. yeah, I think that's like that. And that's what I tried to like hint at today. And like, you and I have had many like talks over the years and presentations around this is I like to do, I don't go as deep as you, but in my talks, I do like to get people thinking, just even mm. asking the right questions, right? Like in terms of, because like the sidecar model was quite revolutionary for a lot of folks, mm. but like I've been using similar patterns for quite some mm. time, right? But you wouldn't like, your talk was like, you know, how the packet flows through Istio. People are like, sidecar, oh, I see. This is why I get certain security guarantees in terms yeah. of like, I'm over a local network versus like, you know, global network, whatever. And I, I think, that's something I've seen a lot of good conference speakers do, is just make people think a little bit, right? In terms of, because I like to be pushed sometimes. Right. Like to your point about, you know, I'm never gonna be building Rust stuff, but I find that stuff fascinating. Right. And often a lot of what you learn is transferable somewhere else. 
like a lot of what I learned in, in yeah. C is transferable to Java and, and Java, like even to yeah. the ops world. Like we talked today in the talk around uh, coupling and cohesion. Like that's yeah. all up and down the stack, right? Coupling, high coupling can be at infrastructure, can be at the application level, all these things. So I just love like, my advice to folks that are new is like, learn as much as you can. Yeah, right? I would, and I you'll would see agree. the patterns emerge. And the, the, the big patterns, I mean, learn as much yeah. in adjacent, but also just step right back. Every time I see Kubernetes, right? Especially in the early days, I was like, it's the actor model, I've done it. I've done yeah. it, I've <laughs> done it, Elixir, this is the actor model. I mean, it's great, sure. But when we can now do actors with languages that don't have actor frameworks, yeah, right? Um, and yeah, I think a lot of those analogies really, really work. You talked about developer experience. There was actually a really good audience question, I think. You know, is that, that not just user? Experience. They were. Yeah. Is that not just user experience? Yes. Like, as developers are users, and you were saying, you should have a product mindset and a product manager and whatever. Do you think developer experience is a solved problem now? So to me, there was a step change with Docker. Like, the technology is yeah, great, right. but one of the main reasons I think containers took off is Docker over LXC or whatever came before it was just yeah. so easy to use. Agreed. And we now have all these TUI frameworks and you can get super shiny, colorful. I'm a terminal <laughs> yeah. person, right? You can get terminal stuff. Also, to your point, it's not stupid if it works that don't look down on people who use yeah. UIs and, yep. and all of this stuff. Do you think enough effort has been put in that we now can't make things even easier to use or are we still on that journey? Oh, great framing. I'd say we definitely are paying a lot more attention to developer experience than we were like five, 10 years ago. I think the Docker example, I use that all the time is a perfect example. Docker gave us good developer experience and a centralized hub to store stuff. That was game changing at the time. I think a lot of the products we use day in, day out do have developer experience at the forefront. Uh, you know, you even argue some of the Kubernetes stuff like kubectl is pretty well engineered, right? right. Like, I was know, gonna say, that was one yeah. of my examples, kubectl explain. Imagine you don't get that in, well, okay, actually you do get it in Vim. That's not really a good analogy, but yeah. But some of that, I remember like, and again, I'm put, um, a bit disappointing find at Amazon, it's mainly because I've used them the most, but I remember in the early days of the Amazon Cloud CLI, mm. I was lost, right? Mm. <laughs> and every command, because like Amazon famously build all their um, technology sort of separately, right? And as long as you yeah. integrate an API, it's fine. But like I learned the command one way to do stuff, and then I yeah. go to a different part of AWS and be all different. <laughs> and like, whereas like once I've learned kubectl, you know, get entity, get resource, yeah. you're kind of good to go, right? So I think a lot of the, a lot of like the things we use day in, day out, it's been really well thought about, but the kind of pitch I made today is I, I think the tools I see people building internally do not have the care yeah. attention applied. And I can speak from personal experience. Like when I used to build tools, I'm like, ah, it'll be fine. I know it's a bit wonky around how you configure this stuff, or I know you've got to spin up like a local binary and make sure you've got the latest JDK installed, whatever, yeah, right? Do you know what I mean? Like you still go, yeah. But then that actually like contributes to bad developer experience. Because mm -hmm. I know Java, I'm happy installing a JDK on my machine or a JRE, right? right? And then yeah. the Ruby person next to me is like, I don't really want to install a JRE. And I'm like, tough luck. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, that's not a good developer experience, right? right? So I think it, like a lot of the stuff, like it's, it's sort of, it's permeated the open source space and CNCF, I think, have done a fantastic mm. job with that to a lot of the degree there. It's Docker led the way, you know, other folks like that as well. But I don't think it's fully permeated the the rest of like the world. Do you know what I mean? No, What's that's a good point. World? You step out of our cloud native bubble, certainly. Yes. Again, we should probably be mindful of the audience here. Yeah. yeah Within totally. cloud native, I, th I think, yeah, Docker was the step change. You now look at kubectl or something being super good. But yeah, you step outside of that. Yeah. Um, and you do get, and I think, yeah, there were some technology changes as well. So the uh, ability of to package something as a as a container, yep, uh, and uh, Go, and of course Rust. Uh, yes. The ability to make a statically compiled binary. <sighs> yeah. It sounds silly, right? But like, <laughs> it's just like you don't have to install a JVM. Yeah. You don't have to use um, the PYVM or whatever it's called, RVM. Yeah, right. none oh. of that messing around. Yeah. You can just use it. You can just get a static binary. I mean, you can you can obviously wrap Java with a with a jar. I think you can get self. -ex These you can get self you can actually build like native. Uh, yeah, you like can images. Get, You always could get self executing jars, wars, but That's they like Spring Boot popularized that. Yeah, but they were huge. Like, with, <laughs> whereas Go, yeah, Go, it'll be if you don't have much business logic, it's five or six meg. I, know, I, I couldn't think. believe it when I started playing around with right. Go stuff. I'm like, oh my, I love Spring Boot. So I love like Java ecosystem, but like 200 meg minimal kind of thing. Yeah, right. I mean, I this makes it thing. Tractable. Tiny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And like the, I don't know, I'd like to get your um, take, Matt. Like, have you played with Wasm very much? Yeah. I think, they do. Like, so obviously yeah. coming back from the sort of like, the old school Java days, Java days, the write once run anywhere was a thing, right? And it's sort of like the joke was write once debug everywhere, I used to say, right? Because <laughs> it never quite worked. Um, Elite like, abstractions. Yeah, that's it, right? And where they weren't quite implemented, you know, standard across the frameworks and across the platforms. 
But I bumped into Asm a lot with the Envoy staff, with like uh, extensions, things like that. But I saw a couple of great talks in QCon New York a couple of weeks ago, talking about Wasm being maybe the sort of ultimate format for building that binary. And then this great talk was from the Cosmonic folks and the oh, Fermion yeah. folks. Yeah, yeah. And they were talking a lot about um, WebAssembly components. How yes. you can like say reuse a uh, Rust library in a Go app, or something like that, yeah. and it just got me thinking like, wow, like to your point, like Go was a game changer. Scratch container, Go binary, yeah. revolutionized the attack surface, the runtime requirements, many things, right? Mm -hmm. But I wonder, do, what's your take on Wasm? Do you think that is the next evolution of where we're going? Because we can compile many languages to a Wasm target, yeah. right? But like, is it? Well, I'd love to get your take on that. It's a really good question. I I really like it. I wish it the best. <laughs> um, I, as in, I hope it works. I think yeah. this has always been a great idea. Yeah. And there's never been an implementation that, as you say, it's been quite right. I'm going to be that old man again. So we've done this before. So LLVM, yeah. actually, there's a really right. great right, blog yes. out there. I'd have to dig out the link for it. It'll take a while, but there's a really great blog explaining like what LLVM. It wasn't just trying to be another C compiler. Obviously, GCC yeah. had its issues, yeah. but it was trying to be so much more than that. And it had this whole idea of it. Uh, it transliterated everything into this intermediate representation, and then all of the front end, this abstract syntax tree of the front end, and it yep. transform that to a bytecode, essentially, and then it would compile the bytecode to machine code. Yep. And that's the, that was the architecture of the compiler, and that let them do compilation of C and C++ better than GCC ever could, because GCC just sort of amalgamated over time. But they had all the tooling that you could mm -hmm. take that bytecode, and you, you didn't have to compile it in the compile phase and then ship the machine code. You could yeah. ship the bytecode. You could, you, it would then, uh, ahead of time compile on the target machine. So you could ship yep. the bytecode anywhere nice. and you would just run it in a little, in a little runtime, but it wasn't really a runtime because it would ahead of time compile it. It would just do the, it was like, mm -hmm. I don't know where I'm going to deploy this. Here's your LLVM bytecode. Oh, it's this machine. Or even this is the whole like Gen 2 Linux philosophy, right? Like, yeah. oh, I know it's going to be an, an AMD 64 laptop. Oh, but it's this specific Intel model. So I can actually like turn on all the processor features and get yeah. the optimizations. This is what, because, because they were C folks, this was the lens I think yeah. they were looking at Super it with. Deep. But they, there was also like, I didn't move it ever got out of experimental stage, but there was a, a just-in-time compiler as well. So anyway, LLVM bytecode tried to be this, this universal format for packaging software and shipping software and interoperability between languages, because you could have a bunch of front ends that were yeah. all compiled to the yeah, Light, light jar, okay, well, you know, it works pretty well. I can have a Scala class and a Kotlin class right, and Java right. class, yep, yep. and it does work. Yep. Like, it does work pretty well. Like, symbol, trying to call the Scala from the Java because of all this, like, symbol man mangling and stuff, but <laughs> yeah. it's sort of just about, just about trying to work. So LLVM tried to do it before, and it just never took off. Yes, I really point. hope Wasm will be that thing with things like um, Wasm time and Wasma, and I mm -hmm. can, you know, I can, they're a lightweight runtime, so I can now essentially dot slash run, you know, I can get a bit of Wasm bytecode as a, as a command line binary, and I can kind of dot slash run it. I can run it server side in a yep. yeah so fermion is essentially um the paths for wasm for what i've heard isn't it yeah oh maybe i'm thinking of it yes well, um, uh, there's a particular tech i think docker can do it natively now so instead of giving you an oci I container yeah. i can see yeah. it containing machine code i can now just give you a wasm bundle so i can run that as a container i get the mm. same it, we still set up namespaces and c groups yep but i don't fork a process i i just run a wasm runtime and so i can i can use it as a packaging format like that and i can also use wasm to embed code in other code for extensions, like you were talking about API gateway yeah, extensions, yeah. right? Yeah, right, Envoy, totally, totally. Envoy yes. gateway, Istio yep. is totally extensible by Wasm. You know, if you're in Golang, which is the cloud native language of choice, you know, I can compile Golang to Wasm. <laughs> it works, it's not perfect. And, but then I can then I can write Go and I can embed it in a C++ program or anything else that yep. hosts Wasm. And conversely, if I've got a Go program, I can use the Wasira library by Tetrate. Um, for <laughs> open source, <laughs> but full, dis full disclosure. Well, for more, more like a full disclosure, it's open source. And then I can write TypeScript or whatever, compile that to Wasm and yeah, yeah. edit. So you've got that interoperability in, in every direction. Um, yeah, I mean, I always do a demo with Istio showing how extensible it yeah. is. And I, 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 a, a lot of folks do this. And one of my colleagues does it with, uh, you know, a screen's worth of TypeScript, compile it, you add a feature to Envoy. I do exactly the same thing, but with a screen's worth of Rust. Yeah. Compile it and it just works. So I, yeah, I really, it just seems, it seems to work well. It has the performance characteristics. Folks have thought about the developer experience and the packaging yes, and the how that we run it, how we oper operationalize it. And it ticks all the boxes of, for me, of proper server-side code, including yep. running natively and running well in a, in a orchestration environment, not technically even containerized, of 
embedding in other processes and extending things, you know, yep. like a Spring Boot module yeah. framework or like an ESB, but hopefully done better. And I could also <laughs> make I can also make command line programs as well. So yeah, how long before we get I think if we ever see a WASM coprocessor, mm. then WASM instructions. Then because remember the um mm. We're going completely off topic here. This is just <laughs> historical apocrypha. The uh, <laughs> Giselle extensions to ARM. So ARM processors had, a, like an AVX or an SSE, they had an extension. They had a set of instructions that was, was basically a hardware implementation of, of oh, JVM operators, yeah, okay, some, yeah, some of them. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they could run Java in an accelerated way by basically saying, this is so ubiquitous. You know what? We're going to give you hardware acceleration for this. Could, Interesting. Now it wasn't all of them because the JVM bytecode is a very high level thing. Like yeah, it's, yeah. it assumes that it's memory managed. It talk, there's a there's a one op for like virtual dispatch, right? It's all very WASM. It's, it's like a like a CISC architecture. WASM is very low level. It doesn't yep. model things like uh, like a virtual dispatch. But I think as a result, it probably makes it much more amenable to being implemented. Mm. I'm making this up, I don't actually, no, actually read about yeah, this yet. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I think if we ever see that, that's probably a We are seeing that success. drive towards specialization, right? But even like ASICs, oh, that right. kind of stuff, right? Yes, yeah, so if I could get an FPGA yeah. and, and, but yes, uh, sorry, very long-winded answer. But I, oh. I, yeah, I am in favor of WASM. I think we've seen the pattern before, but I think the, the devil experience and the, and the, oper the um, operationalization of this is just coming together in a much better way. I suppose we are going a bit off topic, but it's super interesting in that something, I almost forgot about the LLVM stuff, but I remember that, like, we covered it a lot, InfoQ and QCon, there's a big for all, but I never mm. saw a community developer around that. And that's right. one thing I'm seeing a little bit around WASM, like, as a community, right? Mm. And it's even like you and I are sort of, of the cloud native era, right? And I think the, the community built around, like, the CNCF in particular, got to give them another shout out. But, like, as we're building platforms, there is a community around these platforms. I wonder if, like, there's going to be sub-communities around WASM, and if there is, is that then like that? Is that the driver that's finally needed? Because I do think, like to your point around like dialing back to API gateways, if we can write extensions modules in whatever language we're comfortable with and compile mm. it down to WASM, it will get rid of that kind of like dodgy like Lua script type stuff that I'm sure we've all read. Right, right. Do you know what I mean? So I'm wondering, like, is, is the community? I guess is my loaded question there. Is the community the thing that makes or breaks this? I feel like it probably is. I. I I think you need a critical mass. And if you mm. have a critical mass, a community probably emerges. It's probably always going to emerge. Unless your critical mass is defense or research institutions or one of these folks yeah, where you see taken. these texts and they don't yeah. You do have communities of around Slurm or something, yeah, like right. HBC orchestrator within you know defense and academia and CERN, but I, I feel like it never really breaks out. But yeah, I think- It's a very tight community or a very yeah, well-funded community. Yeah, often, exactly. Right? exactly. <laughs> yeah. But with no, and with no incentives to, because they're well-funded maybe, with yeah. no incentives to go out and reach out to, for, to help, for help from other folks. But I think, I, I think we are seeing a community insofar as there's multiple compiler projects. There's yeah, multiple, multiple yep. runtimes yep, yep. on the back end. There's at least one runtime. Mm -mm. Uh, and there is now the CNCF again. Shout out to them yep. to sort of make, hopefully help bring all these folks to you know, make conferences and host projects it, right? and provide yeah. test infrastructure. Um, so I would, yeah, I would hope so. Maybe that is maybe that is the difference. I don't know why that LLVM stuff didn't get the critical. No, mass, you've definitely but, sparked the memory. I remember having many discussions with it. Can't remember that time mm. frame, but then disappeared, right? And then Wasm right. popped up on my radar, particularly around some of the Envoy Wasm mm. stuff I was looking at at the time, and I was like, oh, and the. the the dream of being able to write any language to compile down to extension, I was like, yes, this sounds very interesting. And now I'm, I am just seeing more of this community emerge. But I think to your point, time will tell, right? Right. And that's why I do my examples in Rust, is because yeah. it's, it's, it's the anti-Lua. Like, yeah, <laughs> you probably want to write yeah, TypeScript totally. yeah. or, or yeah, yeah. a Zig or something like realistically, but I'm going to show you it can be done in like a hardcore language. Yeah, interesting. Because, and if you do run this in a tight loop, you are going to get good performance because it's just so far removed from, from Lua, which I'm not a fan of. <laughs> yeah, I've had to learn Lua like several times for various extensions, but like, yeah, not a fan. <laughs> yeah, right. I should give you the opportunity to talk about your book, which is just, I have to confess, I haven't read it. Um, <laughs> I'll get you a copy. We're good. You, okay, then yeah, okay, we'll do this again and I'll come better informed. Do you wanna do you wanna tell me by, by proxy everybody else? Like, <laughs> yeah. What is the thesis of this book? Yeah, so we started actually just uh, as the pandemic emerged. So it's been quite a therapeutic project for myself, uh, Jim Goff and, and, and Matt Alban, like with the three of us came together. It's focused on mastering API architecture. That's the title, right? And it actually it was born in New York. Uh, February 2020, so just as the pandemic was unfortunately emerging, um, uh, myself, Jim, and Matt had been uh, to a, a Riley Software Architecture Conference, and they were talking about API gateways, so was I, and we realized that 
you know, something probably we see in a lot of conferences that the knowledge that we thought was kind of like obvious uh, was not obvious at all. It's like common sense, anything but common, right? Okay. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And like, when we were like saying, hey, like you clearly need to like, you know, think about extensibility of gateways or you think about your security posture. And there's a lot of people saying, this is great knowledge. Could you go a bit deeper? We were like, oh, interesting. We, we kind of struck okay. a bit of a seam of gold as we we're chipping mm. away there, right? So um, yeah, we reached out to O'Reilly and pitched them and, and they said, oh, the API architecture is a hot topic at the moment. Mm. Um, so along with cloud native and Kubernetes was like super popular. And we were like, oh, we can cover all those things, right? Mm. So it turned, you know, the title is Mastering API Architecture, but it turned into a kind of cloud native um, communication book, if you like. So we talked a lot about um, how you would migrate from like the traditional world into the cloud uh, and using sort of the API uh, as the lens of how to do that. Do you know what I mean? Because we see a lot of folks doing digital transformations and they're, mm. they're often like that, that word is super overloaded to be honest, but all oh, those words are super overloaded, but oftentimes they're being API driven, like their business is moving to offering uh, some of their services via an API, that kind of thing. Mm. And they're often moving to the cloud and they're embracing DevOps principles. So like all those things that, you know, were mentioned there, are often tied into how you manage your APIs, how you manage your cloud native communications. So the book literally covers like soup to nuts all the way through. We talk about um, sort of like some of the high level concepts around designing APIs, like thinking about REST versus uh, Protobuf or gRPC versus GraphQL, like sort of mixing my metaphors there or mashing up the different levels. But we get people thinking about these are your options, these are mm -hmm. um, the trade offs you're going to be making. And then we talk about testing. I wrote the chapters around the API gateway, naturally, yes, right? Yeah. And the service mesh, naturally. Um, so like sort of getting people thinking about how um, to go around evaluating their technology solutions and, and choices. And then towards the end of the book, we talk a lot about um, migration. So migrating towards an API architecture or, or a somewhat like a microservice. We tried to avoid that word quite a lot in the book because like Sam Newman has got that one covered. He's yeah, done a fantastic yeah, job, right? Has, yeah. And I, we didn't want to write Sam's book again because he's done a, you know, two or three amazing books. So we sort of said it's service oriented with an API so yeah. that commonly is microservices uh, these days. Uh, and then we, yeah, we talked about the migration towards that, migration towards cloud tech. And then we did try and get a couple of chapters in there around security. Because like, you and I are constantly talking yeah, about yeah. the importance of yeah. security, right? And I would be honest and say as a developer, when I first started out, didn't think so much about security or performance, right? Yeah. And then as my career progressed, I totally did. So um, we're trying to put that on people's radar. Think about the illities. Think about the security, the observability, yeah. the performance, that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, good feedback so far. We launched it in, I think, November last year. So we've got the hard copies around then. Um, and um, the journey has just begun. Like once you put a book out there, then you get all the feedback. And you're, yeah, you're an idiot. Right. You're brilliant. Like, yeah, right. V2. V2 <laughs> will be perfect. <laughs> That's yeah, exactly. We're, we're like every piece of software I write, the version <laughs> yeah. two will be absolutely flawless. We're totally yeah. like looking at that. So um, we're, we're thinking of um, doing some like uh, training courses and stuff. Obviously the world is now opening back up. Um, we uh, didn't have the, the, the first book I wrote. You know, I created a whole bunch of like other material with my buddy Abraham, I wrote it with, um, Abraham Rimperez. And we did we sort of like, we promoted it and shared more knowledge where the kind of the world opening up around the whole um, release of, of Mastering ABI Architecture has like uh, meant it more, it's been a bit more challenging getting the word out there. So okay. like, thank you, appreciate you asking me about it because I'm keen to obviously get it No, out I there, think right? it's a great topic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. of course, and I'm yeah, happy to, but uh, yeah, I think it's a great topic and I actually wanted to learn a little about it as well. I get, I've given a talk, um, not a go-to. Well, have I given the talk yet? Maybe I've just written it. Anyway, on essentially, because you say again, you say that um, you think this knowledge is is common, and I find it isn't. I joined yeah, a agreed. I joined a company once, like really good actually. Everyone in the team was really good, like super. Everybody was super high quality, but they knew their area, and I kind of turned up and I built them. I used the buff tooling, which I really like. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I won't put you on your spot. I know you're in this area. I won't put you yeah. on your spot for the your opinion on anything because you still got to play in that sandbox. <laughs> but uh, I personally really like the buff tooling. And I kind of built them this whole thing where, you know, folks would write, there was a repo, you would you would do interface driven design, yep. you know, like we used to in a, in a good monolith, but you would write, yeah, a, enough, you know, right? you yeah. would write your, um, you know, contract driven design, whatever you want to call it, you would say, I want to do this microservice. Okay, show me the API design. Um, we use, pre, you, you use Proto or Open API, but you just had to give some kind of IDL spec for it. That would yep. go past all the principal engineers or whatever, we, we'd sign it off. Yeah. And then you check that in and then a whole lot of machinery would kick in, mostly using the buff stuff. You'd end up in a schema registry so that other folks could find it and yeah, say, nice. oh, there's that service being offered. And these here's are the, these are the methods on it. Yeah. Here's how I call it. Some of them are REST, some of them were RPC. Again, we were agnostic to that, but like, here's how I interact with it. 
And then the machinery would just go build you a bunch of uh, libraries, right? A bunch of client libraries nice. for it. Yeah. So that you, if you wanted to consume the service, you would just, whatever language you're in, you would like go get, or you would pip install or, you know, whatever um, the, the client stub for, for this uh, service. And then you would have code that would, and that code was quite thick in the first instance because the company didn't have a service mesh. And the, right. know, the idea was we could just shave it off, make it thin, nobody would know. And the service mesh would then start doing the retries and the timeouts oh, okay. time okay. and that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. Makes sense. Um, and the other, the really nice thing that came off the back end that I hadn't heard of anybody doing before was when we, when you bumped, when you wanted to make a break, so we did Semver on the APIs, you yep. wanted to make a break and change, you had to call it API V2. So your package would then get a major version number bump. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And the consumers would have to take that major, like uh, Dependabot wouldn't PR it for them. Consumers would have to take that version bump. So we could then use the security apparatus we had in uh, place, the dependency stuff, to say, oh, I want to deprecate v1 of my API. Who's using it? Uh, and you don't have to yeah. sniff network traffic yeah. because we had this. Usually, see who's bringing it into this the is a financial yeah. institution, yeah. right? So you often like a lot of stuff would only run once a year for like end of year reporting. So you yeah. just it wasn't safe. That's a good to, point. to know yeah. whether version one was not being called until you've given it twelve months of literally sniffing all the packages. Yeah, that's really so good. To be point. like, does anybody still consume v1 of this client stuff package? Okay, I'll go. And call, I'll go talk yeah. to them. Nice. So I built all that, machine. and I thought again, I thought this was common knowledge. I thought oh, they haven't done it yet because they just had other engineering priorities. And I kind of sat. Down with one of the engineering directors one day and explained this and they were like that would be such a big lever to pull <laughs> so you know it's really i love that kind of stuff i think yeah. it's such a great developer experience i think that is platform engineering even though it's a great a server it's really like it's you know, dev enablement or whatever you want to call it i do you know, know the dev enablement because i think people sort of mash the two topics together developer experience dev enablement and again like to like to the point earlier on we made people have been doing these things for time but now we're putting sort of labels on it. I think like what you said there is like, it's like solid architecture principles, good team enablement, right. but like people don't always take yeah. that bigger picture. So they're like, mm. my team is doing okay. And or, you know, whether my team is a operational team or a service team, they're like, they're thinking locally. But I think what yeah. you said there, Matt, is like you've definitely taken that global perspective, right? Consumer driven contracts or contract based right. testing. Like you've taken that step back. And I think that's something that unless you've been there before, like, or, you know, worked as a contract or a consultant where you've pattern matched, you mm. don't always see the need to do that. And that's why I think that, you know, as a contract or a consultant, everything's that's obvious, common knowledge. Yeah, right. and it's, but when you're in your own little world like, and you work there for 10 years, like, okay. you know what I mean? You haven't poked your head up because you've been so busy. Like that suddenly someone else coming in with these new ideas, like, oh, wow, that's revolutionary, right? <laughs> but it's super, cool. again, we don't want to be, you know, say sort of, you know, 1% is an elitist thing. How do folks keep up with this? How do folks, get themselves armed yeah. with, because you can't know everything. I certainly don't know everything. How do folks get themselves armed with these good ideas? By I the mean, book, obviously, you know, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, by the, yeah, by the book. So, yeah, read read the good books. Yeah. Uh, again, won't offer opinions, but uh, you know, there's certain publishers who you know have like a, I I agree, know, a I fairly agree. high barrier for entry. Yeah, yeah. Go to conferences or watch the videos. I mean, what, what, what would you add? I've done the easy ones. What would you? Yeah, I mean, I think it is carving out time to learn, isn't it? And that's what because initially I was the second book. I was thinking, do we write a book? Do people read books these days? Because like, that's how I literally learned Java was yeah, like yeah. from a book, right? Yeah. <laughs> back in the day, back twenty years ago. Um, and now, like some of the folks I'm mentoring, the younger generation, they're like, I watch you know videos on YouTube yeah. or Pluralsight or you know you know me, what take your pick. Um, I'm like, do people still read books? But a good chunk of folks, particularly what I call the, or Gene Yang calls the 99% folks, people getting stuff done, right? right they're, yeah. To your point, they're almost too busy to go to conferences yeah, sometimes, exactly. right? So like by jumping on YouTube, like GoTo have got a fantastic channel as mm -hmm. an example, right? Of short form content, long form content, carving out like a lunch and learn once a mm -hmm. week or putting some, you know, some time aside to like, to watch these things, read the books, because to your point, they're generally, you know, higher quality um, uh, sort of uh, editorial content. Like you just have to make time, right? Yeah. And like, and then um, yeah, InfoQ like uh, is a good place. Like if you want sort of signposts, jumping off points. The new stack's pretty good. Some other sites out there as well. Uh, like sort of just keeps you common and keeps you like if you keep seeing this like word all the time, like consumer yeah. contracts or WASM. Like you don't have to be an expert, but just have a little right. look at it. It's like oh, actually this consumer driven contract thing. Like we've been trying to do this. But we didn't know it was oh, a thing. Oh, that's the name for yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, right. And, and now I know what to punch into Google to find boom. the best, the state of the art. That's it. Yeah, I think, and actually the ThoughtWorks tech radar takes oh, a lot of that. effort yeah. of that yeah, out of you. Yeah. Have a look at the terms. That's, a, that's a great shout If you don't yeah. recognize one. Yeah, yeah. And this, I think it's about being T-shaped, right? So how do <laughs> yeah, I go, yeah. how do I know a little bit about everything so I know whether that's maybe the right solution yeah. to look at? Yeah, the conference, conference talk videos, shorts. YouTube channel, I'll shout out my friend Dave, you know, Dave Flanagan, uh, his YouTube channel, oh, yeah, but there's fantastic, right? yeah, fantastic yeah. stuff, but there's loads of it. 
And then if something does become your day job, if you do need to dive in, you still I, jump I feel like we've fucked ourselves so much. Right? I've, done some <laughs> yeah. LinkedIn, I've done some LinkedIn learning courses, you know, oh, you, Udemy and whatever, yeah. or a book, right? And yeah. then you can, I think you need to know a broad set of things, I agree. as you say. I agree. Yeah. With time, you've also seen them all before and go, oh, Kubernetes, that's just Erlang. But <laughs> yeah. to sort of know the patterns and to, and to match them. And you can do that without being a consultant and seeing, yes. you know, a thousand businesses over 10 years. And then you can dive in, I think, through... That's it. Uh, yeah, through going to a particular conference on a particular subject. You know, my first KubeCon was literally, we've heard of this Kubernetes thing. Hey, Matt, work out whether <laughs> this is the right thing to use at this company. And I just yeah. went to the first one. So many folks did that. Even and now, it was, that happens, it was so right? small. I just felt like a meetup. I ended up going up to sort of Tim Hawking and being like, excuse me, can you explain <laughs> this part of the system so I know whether I should use it? Um, and then, you know, the rest is history with, with my career because I was like, actually, I like this so much. I'm going to leave, yeah, I'm gonna leave my right? software engineering job. I want this to be my full-time gig, not my side gig. I'm actually going to leave my software engineering job and come do this full time. But for most folks, it's a tool. You get it, you, know, you understand it, you get it done, you move on and you, you keep doing it. But the opportunities what, the what are they sometimes. Yeah, like, sometimes the opportunities yeah. prevent themselves. I mean, this is an anecdote from me. I don't want folks to overfit to that kind of story. But yeah, yeah. Um, you know, as an example, if I want to dive into that, there are, you know, there are materials available. Cool. So I think we've been told to move on. I just heard a round of applause from the, from the talk in the next room. The mics might have put that up as well. But uh, no, that was fascinating, Daniel. Thanks very much. Thanks for uh, to chat, man. It's always yeah. good to chat to you. Now we've got it on camera. We shared some of our knowledge as well. Yeah, exactly. Good, right? yeah, I learned a bunch of stuff. I'm going to go and rewatch this, honestly, and <laughs> yes, re listen yeah. to all the things that. Uh, notes, right? Yeah, that you said, because I was trying to think of what I was going to say next. I'm going to re listen to all the stuff <laughs> that you were trying to teach me. So no, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Appreciate it. Thanks.